and we're going to start with Mr. Wrencher so he can talk about uh, what community is for his clientele. It's good to be with you. Um, I wear two hats. One, I work with Family Search as the Chief Genealogical Officer, but I'm also the Chair of the Record Preservation and Access Committee for the National Genealogical Society and for the Federation of Genealogical Societies and the uh, Jewish Genealogical Society. We have a stated mission to advise the genealogical community on ensuring proper access to historic records of genealogical value in whatever media they are recorded and supporting strong record preservation and uh, policies and practices. We try to do that uh, throughout, the, throughout the country and throughout the world. And so we stay focused and tuned into issues that threaten that access. And newspaper agencies and, and uh, publishers are often our allies in these uh, fights. Uh, and oftentimes we are trying to, to get access to records that in, in the end uh, both are used for uh, in the news media and are used for uh, genealogical purposes. And so our community is very concerned about not only the, the loss and the destruction of records, but also the access to records and the access to uh, those records on an ongoing basis. We're concerned about uh, electronic storage of these records and the fact that uh, dynamic or static files uh, may be lost to future generations and that they will not understand the uh, context of uh, American history and what is going on with the context of the family and the family uh, uh, network. And so that, all of those issues for our community are uh, deemed as very uh, appropriate and very serious issues which we monitor on an ongoing basis. Okay, um, my audience is, is the state of Oklahoma, and when I talk about that, I, I'll, I'll lead off of a quick story. Well, we had the uh, pleasure of having two-time Pulitzer Prize winner Anthony Shadid uh, of the New York Times come to our newsroom. He's an Oklahoma City native, and uh, as you know, Shadid was recently, he and uh, three other journalists were captured in Libya and then uh, endured torture before they were released. And uh, uh, he came uh, to Oklahoma City uh, for a brief uh, talk at the Oklahoma City Bombing Memorial Museum, and then I asked him to come in the newsroom to talk about journal journalism and what he had endured. And two things that he made points to us about was uh, the best stories come are those that are about people and the best journalism comes when you care about what you're writing about. And what we're dealing with with his history and historical archives today is getting those people in our audience to care uh, and finding new ways and new platforms to get them to care. Um, so when we're talking about our, our, our audience, we're talking about a very diverse population in Oklahoma that has a deep Native American heritage uh, to that as well as different cultures that have come into the state through the years. Uh, that's our audience. Our audience uh, also includes uh, media from national media that uh, want to uh, uh, do stories that are related to Oklahoma, uh, to uh, authors, to educators, uh, to historians such as Bob Burke, who is a, a, an attorney who is writing uh, now has massed nearly 100 books uh, on different people and their history in Oklahoma. Uh, so our audience is wide and varied, uh, not only in, inside Oklahoma, but outside Oklahoma as well. Okay. Good segue to Remo. <clears throat> I was thinking earlier as uh, Dean Mill spoke about the goal of strengthening democracy. Um, and then Martha talked about the importance of public-private partnerships. Um, it struck me that one of the communities where these two things come together in a big way is the community of public libraries. All libraries really, but public libraries especially. Um, when we get to the next topic, I'll say more about this, but one of the interesting things about the history of American newspapers is that the first part of that history from 1690 to 1820 has been digitized. Um, virtually every paper, 2,120 titles. Um, that happened as a result of a partnership between the American Antiquarian Society and about 300, a few more than 300 libraries, mainly public libraries, including a number of state historical archives, that um, 
had the um, wisdom to keep the paper copies of their papers, uh, some of these papers going back to the early 1800s, um, long before that. So that partnership over 60 years yielded the microfilm and then the digital um, creation of the first large archive at that time. Um, I think that today, public libraries find themselves threatened by the internet, the disintermediative impact of the internet, just as much as newspapers do, perhaps even more. Um, Chris Callan spoke earlier about the business model, the partnerships, the public-private partnerships that's always existed between libraries and, in this case, the private part is the publishers. Um, it's been a symbiotic relationship that has kept libraries, the business model of libraries, public libraries, fairly sustainable for many years. I think that the kind of partnerships Chris spoke about, the kind represented by the commercial vendors, uh, maintains that for libraries because the taxpayers, through the public libraries, can afford to purchase material that otherwise really couldn't be created by the publishers, and it gives the libraries material, in many cases, that can't be disintermediated by the internet. The projects are too big, they're too expensive, they involve too many hundreds of millions of pages um, for individuals to buy them the way, the way they buy books. They're more like encyclopedias. The old encyclopedia market was really a library-driven market. They used to be the publisher, um, Lord help me, of the Americana, back in the days when the Americana was in almost every public library in the United States. Um, that model doesn't really work so much for encyclopedias, at least generic encyclopedias, but for digital newspaper archives, I think that that traditional model for public libraries can still offer the public, especially the working class public that can't afford the kind of tools that other parts of American society can, it gives libraries a way to maintain um, a position in this, uh, this uh, economic structure that's emerging with the internet. Um, it also helps newspapers. In many cases, these, uh, the, the business model I'm discussing here um, circles back and provides royalties to newspapers, gives newspapers a way to help digitize their own back files. I do think that um, there are different categories of newspapers, chronologically in different types, that we'll get to in, in, in the next segment. But I do think that um, the library world, the community of librarians, has to main, you know, maintain itself as part of the loop. Okay. Put on it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay, make sure I can be heard. Um, my community has more to do on the local level, the general public that looks into research in their own family history, um, also historic preservation that looks to interpret their cultural landscaping, basically all of our history on a larger um, platform. And like David, I'm also concerned with access to materials, especially newspapers um, that have a lot of, of information but hard to obtain. And um, the proper use of that information, I know someone in the last um, panel discussion talked about you know, what we're putting out um, and our, our local papers and who's putting it in there for context. So that's a concern for me on that level. And also just the interpretation of how we're using that information. Uh, so that, that's a lot of, um, well actually it's a small amount of trying to encompass everything that I go on through. I work with um, independently for clients. I work with local historical societies within Missouri and outside of Missouri. So I'm not just in one um, region. And the focus, a lot of it is, is really just understanding what our past was like, understanding how we got here, and um, that access to newspapers especially is, is really essential in trying to make sure that we have a proper context because, of course, every paper has got a little bias. <laughs> and I think having different versions of those events that happen are really important. And if we overlook it and just use one paper that survived instead of 5,000, we can be skewed in the wrong direction. So a, a lot of that interpretation for me is, is very fundamental and I look forward to the rest of its discussion. Great. 
Well, now we're going to get to the issue of how you frame the problem of lost content, and, and is it really a problem, and, and uh, what kind of problem for various communities? So we're going to start again with David, and um, and I have a little prop here for you archivists to get to get wiggy about. Um, <laughs> but I, I didn't steal this from a library; it was from my grandmother's barn. barn so <laughs> just I'm clean on that one. Stored under archival preservation. Yeah, techniques. yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah. Um, as I travel uh, throughout the country, uh, the most complete set of newspapers I often find are held in the county courthouse. They were compiled there as a result of the probate judge wanting copies of the notices of probate uh, for the community. And so oftentimes those are stored in uh, basements. This uh, image that you see here is a courthouse in Alabama. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, the collection is rapidly deteriorating. With my other hat on, uh, working at Family Search, we have cameras that go out throughout the United States and uh, digitize or, in the past, microfilmed records in courthouses. But we excluded newspapers because of their volume. The size was simply overwhelming. And so while uh, since 1938, uh, when we've been microfilming, we have amassed a microfilm collection of 2.4 million rolls and 3.5 billion images in that microfilm collection, we have a similar collection now of digital content that we've been collecting now for almost 10 years, 200 cameras operating in 40 countries around the world. But as you can see, the volume of newspapers would quickly dwarf um, that collection of vital records. The challenge, and so we frame it for our community, however, is probably best put in terms of lost content in other arenas uh, other than newspapers. And so uh, we have, uh, we keep track of areas where there are burned courthouses. And so out of the 3,200 courthouses in the United States, 646 of those counties have had some uh, fire uh, with some percent of lost records of that material. What that means is that notices in the newspaper may be one of the few records that reconstruct or compensate for the loss of that record, uh, for the loss of those records in that courthouse. And so it may be the only instance of uh, an inference of death. Uh, it may be the only record of marriage. It may be uh, the only record for deserters in the military or runaway slaves or any other instance of historical fact that weaves basically the fabric of Americana. So we're concerned about uh, compensating for that loss and for the, um, um, the, the overwhelming amount of data there is to collect uh, with historic newspapers, and that's uh, probably why they are uh, so diligently trying to digitize much of that. But much of those, many of those collections, as you can see from the previous pictures, are not in uh, good repair, and but they're the best we have. <coughs> Ladonna, do you want to go? <laughs> Got to think. <laughs> um, David has a good point on that photo where things are just sitting in a box, and that's actually a really pretty picture. Um, sometimes <laughs> it's um, very disastrous, and it, it literally makes me want to cry. And I have actually stood there and, and shed a tear, too, because not only are the records sitting there, everyone that works at these courthouses, historical societies, um, university archives, that have mounds of this material um, dying, basically, as you're watching it go, they really want to have some way of doing this. And having someone like Family Search come in and digitize is wonderful. The problem is it's an overwhelming amount of information. And what they can attack in one year is just, just so small versus how much is being lost. Um, I don't know the statistics on that. You might be able to pull that up. But I know just personally going into an archive, trying to find one document to prove some type of fact is not easy. These things are not categorized. They're missing. They're moved. I've had one courthouse. I won't say which one. It's in Missouri. And I'm looking for regular records that are still using today, probate records. And they could not find a whole set. They went in the basement. They went in the attic. I found portions of it. The thing is, is not only are we having a problem with 
things sitting and collecting dust and melting away. They are being moved. They're being forgotten about. Um, attrition with everyone, you know, leaving that are clerks that know where something is, they leave office or pass away. It's not being told what happened to previous records. So a way for digitization to help this is to be able to, in a shorter amount of time, scan and, and collect, add metadata, and um, really gather this information into some type of repository, digital, of course, and have that access available. You won't have to go box by box in chronological order. For instance, when I'm working with the Historical Society and we are transcribing, because that's the closest on a local level that we can attack this type of issue, is for that access is to grab a book, a register that weighs about 20 pounds, <laughs> and pull it down and start transcribing in minimal things, surnames, <coughs> dates, counties, the type of information you're going to be reaching for to be able to go back and retrieve that register. The problem is, is that transcription is not a copy of that original document. And without digitization, you're losing the rest of the information that's obtained there. You're losing the location of that register, for instance. And if, if it's lost, now a lot of um, in uh, institutions are closing. A lot of local societies across the country that have helped do not just transcribing, but helping with the digitization process are closing. And I think that's also probably going to run into a little issue with a lot of the companies that are willing to do this digitization, you know, because they don't know these records. They come in and someone has to tell them. Someone has to tell them what they grab. Um, so in that process, I guess I'm in the earlier stages of where digitization um, can help and assist. So I'm in southeast Missouri. We have um, quite a few counties along the Mississippi River, and as far as newspapers, are limited. They are not here. The collection here on campus of the State Historical Society is, is immense, and they can interlibrary loan, but sometimes some of them just can't um, handle the cost, even of shipping. They might purchase microfilm for one newspaper in their local town, if they're lucky. And those newspapers are not all entirely. For instance, one for Jefferson County, Missouri, it begins at 1866 and goes through the present. But there's patches, you know, basically missing dates. There's no index. There's no way to access, you know, quickly of researching something, even if it's for scholarly or genealogical purposes. So digitization is going to be helpful in that aspect. It's going to be helpful for patrons. But the main thing is, is trying to get those patrons able to have an option. And in a rural area like Missouri, that's not a large option. I mean, we have thousands of newspapers across the country, many in Kansas City, St. Louis. But the rural areas, unless you're going to drive to those places, yeah, you know, the, the access is a really big issue on a local level. So I hope we can discuss that a little more. Um, and I lost my train of thought on what our original <laughs> question was. But <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll deal with what we're dealing with at the Oklahoman. Uh, we have a, a digitized text archive that dates back uh, to the early, to before 1900 and just after 1900, but we did not... Uh, digitized the Oklahoma City Times, which was the afternoon newspaper uh, in Oklahoma City till 1985. Um, we also uh, sometimes have difficulties with computer systems, and uh, and when you uh, introduce a new software or computer system in, you sometimes lose your archive content. We, for example, we lost thousands of stories from 1997 and 98 that didn't transfer properly over to a new computer system, uh, which takes a lot of man hours to uh, put those back into the archive system. Another thing I'm not hearing uh, thus far is the photo archives. Um, uh, we're dealing with an issue in the newspaper industry of disintegrating photo files. Uh, we have 1.6 million photos uh, in our photo archive system. Uh, that date back uh, to the land run days of, of the 1880s 
have a lot of historical context to them. Uh, it would take a significant number of man hours to digitize all those photos uh, into uh, the system. We've done some of them. Uh, we've not uh, even scratched the surface of, of the uh, total number that could be in that. So we're putting a priority on what uh, photos of a particularly historical context, and we're making decisions about that, uh, those particular photo f files. And as you probably have read, if you've not read, uh, this is becoming a big debate in the uh, uh, newspaper industry about what to do with those photo files. As you know, memorabilia hunters are after our photo files so they can sell them uh, for a profit. And, and that what they're offering in the newspaper industry is basically, uh, well, we'll take your files, we may give you some money, um, and we'll digitize those for you. Uh, and, and, you know, and the industry's probably replying, well, what are they worth? Uh, we have an editor at the Oklahoma that says, next to manpower, our photo files is the second most valuable asset we have at the Oklahoma. And uh, those files are very important to us, and we have to be cautious about how we turn over those photo archives uh, to those who might seek them to become memorabilia and, and frame photos in somebody's home that they sold on eBay or for some other purpose. Uh, so I think that's a worry uh, that we have to have today, is not only how the text archives are being treated, but how the photo archives uh, are being treated as well. <clears throat> yeah, orphan newspapers, um, I think that it might be helpful in this or any discussion about them to think of them in at least three categories, partly because I think different solutions exist for them. I mentioned the first category, 1690 to 1820. That was the period covered by Clarence Brigham in his History and Bibliography of American Newspapers. This is why we know so much about them. So again, we're librarians. Uh, he was a librarian, American Antiquarian Society. Libraries have played a role in doing um, what we've been talking about today for many years. The second period, 1820 to 1922. Why 1922? Because before 1922, newspapers are in the public domain. After 1922, they're not. And then there's a very different legal situation about which I think we'll hear more this afternoon. I've said a bit about the early period, 1690 to 1820, but in, in the context of this group, I thought another couple of things were interesting. Newspapers have always been extremely ephemeral. Of those 2,120-odd newspapers published in that 130 years, only 34 list lasted more than 30 years, and only 10 lasted more than 50 years. It was out of 2,100 newspapers. Um, they were also, the business models were very different in that early period. They were not sold. The average man on the street didn't have newspapers at his disposal. These were for businessmen. They were sold as subscriptions, generally for more than the man on the street could afford. The reason for that second period, 1820 to 1922, this is when newspapers became what we think of as newspapers today, and they started to explode across the country. Um, there's more than 50,000 newspapers published during this period. Um, so part of the challenge there is um, at least for the foreseeable future, you have to select which ones you're going to do. So that becomes another part of the process. It's not, not just we're going to digitize them. Well, which ones do you digitize first and why? And that gets back to the question of communities. Who really needs them? That's going to help guide the selection process. One thing that the um, commercial vendors of newspapers do is work with teams of scholars. The head of our team of scholars for selecting the early American newspapers is in this room. Jeff Pasley, one of your professors here and an expert in early American newspapers, literally ranked, stack ranked, the newspapers in early American history with a rationale for why this one's more important for that one, for what, uh, and for what, well, for what community, in this case, for the community of historians, uh, more so than genealogists, which should have a very different look. Um, so th for the second period here, thousands of newspapers, I think that the solution there will remain uh, uh, a solution shared by the Library of Congress, wonderful uh, project, and the commercial vendors. In many cases, libraries and state historical societies are simply doing it themselves, which is great. I think those things will work in a symbiotic way and fill that in. Where it gets tricky 
is from 1922 to ASCII, up to the advent of ASCII text files, uh, typically in the 1980s. Um, the, the problem here, and the reason the solutions are, tend to vary, is a simple matter of scale. In the 19th century, newspapers were typically four pages at the beginning and only about nine or, or 12 pages toward the end. A big city daily published maybe 120,000 pages um, over that, that, that period. Uh, they, were not, uh, they were not big. The newspaper explosion in terms of pages is what makes it difficult. Now, a single big city daily publishes more uh, from 1922 to ASCII than was published by all the newspapers in America up to 1820. Um, small dailies from 1922 up to ASCII published three to 400,000 pages. Um, a middle size daily is anywhere from half a million to 900,000 pages. A big city daily, 800,000 pages up to maybe even two million pages. Um, this makes it extremely difficult for commercial vendors, for the Library of Congress, for anyone. Uh, and then within that grouping, there are the truly orphaned papers, the ones that have gone out of business. Um, and then ironically, in some cases, those are the ones that are more difficult for legal reasons. Uh, if you're working with a, a paper that is in business, then the paper can assume the responsibility for handling the legal uh, issues created by the Tassini versus the New York Times ruling, which makes it incumbent upon the publisher to clear certain articles, certain photographs, and so on, that were created not by the newspaper, but by freelancers. If a paper is not in business, went out of business 10 years ago, and you're the vendor or you're the state historical library who wants to digitize it, who then bears the legal responsibility for the digital photographs that were created not by the paper, but by someone else? So. I think that in these, in these three categories, I think the early papers, you know, pretty much not an issue now. Uh, the 19th century papers, at least up to 1922, I think that actually is an issue that will be sorted out. I think, uh, I think the, um, the Library of Congress is leading the way there in many ways. Um, it's the 20th century, and especially the truly orphaned papers, the, um, the especially small city and middle city dailies where the, um, the value uh, model is even more difficult than for the big city dailies, the ones that are truly orphaned, are the ones to, to really worry about. And then you still have the question of which ones more than others. So I think this is a, uh, a definitely a worthy pursuit. I think those are some of the, the big challenges. So we all have low blood sugar because <laughs> lunch is coming up, and um, we've heard all this depressing information. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but maybe we can talk a little bit uh, more positively about some of the solutions that are starting to emerge. And certainly many of you will be talking more about some of these and some of these really valuable collaborations later on. But just if, if we can hear of a couple of the solutions. And um, I think, um, Joe, is, do you want to go next? Is sure. that... Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, I, I think that when I referred to the Anthony Shadid comment about caring about your journalism, I think we're dealing with an aspect, two different aspects, and I think Chris really hit upon it. One is the publisher, uh, that, that commercial value of, of the publisher needs to care, the owners need to care. The second thing is the public. The public needs to care about the, the sense of history. Um, and I'm, I'm a concern... Uh, that there's a decreasing uh, number of people who really care about history. I'm sorry, that's, that's a major concern of mine uh, in, in younger generations about historical context. First on the publisher aspect, the owner's aspect, we're looking into what we call revenue-centric content or sponsored content, uh, basically producing quality content that can be sponsored by institutions. Uh, and what content can be? Is there an inventory of content that you can provide that can be sponsored by institutions that can provide revenue that, that is so important uh, to that bottom line? The second thing is, is in the uh, area of making the public care through different types of platforms. 
And so what we've done at the Oklahoma with our website, newsok.com, is developed a history page. And on the history page, you can see we're still struggling with this because you see the sponsor spot is basically our own house type of advertising as well. But on this history page, we have a columnist called the Archivist, and basically her job is to take uh, historical uh, items of history uh, and tr how are they relevant today? How do they relate to you uh, as a well? And it runs in the newspaper. Uh, we also uh, have videos. We showcase our photos. Uh, we talk about what uh, is going to be the history of the future. Uh, as well as what we've done special, special projects, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, World War II stories. You probably read about the number of veterans who are dying and the fact that they basically will be an extinct generation. Uh, so we did a collaborative project with the local uh, public television channel uh, interviewing uh, veterans and their uh, thoughts on, on that, that part of history as well. One thing I particularly want to show you is what we've developed a multimedia showcase uh, called Stories of the Ages. And Stories of the Ages take stories of lore in Oklahoma and turn them into a multimedia sense. I'm going to show you a few of those real quickly. Uh, for example, we did one called Graceful Heritage on the five uh, famous American Indian ballerinas who came from Oklahoma. Uh, we, and we did this in a multimedia sense as well. Uh, all of you are familiar with Grapes of Wrath and its connections to Oklahoma. And its recent anniversary, the 70th anniversary of John Steinbeck's book, uh, we actually turned a multimedia project from that, uh, not only an in-depth story, but a video. Um, you know, you can turn the pages, you can get historical context from it. Uh, the whole bit about what the Grapes of Wrath meant to Oklahoma and its controversy in Oklahoma uh, as well, um, and, and the stories that we tell because of it. Um, Geronimo, uh, as I said before, the richness of the American Native, uh, the Native American population in Oklahoma, and how Geronimo was imprisoned uh, at Fort Sill in Oklahoma, and here's the video from that particular. Even amongst the Apaches themselves, Geronimo sort of has this, they see him as the protector, their defender, and then others see him as the reason that they were imprisoned. One hundred years after his death, Geronimo is still a controversial figure. His name evokes images of a fierce warrior, a rebel, and a legend. Personality-wise, many people thought of him as um, argumentative and talkative and insertive. He was born in present-day Arizona in 1829 as Goyakla, or one who yawns. Okay, then we, we, we've done stories on, uh, this is a, an interesting one, Depression-era gangsters uh, that occurred, and, and you know, still today, movies are being made about those gangsters. And it was interesting in this particular context that that we were able to do a video, a story, photos. Um, we were able to do an interactive map, that visual part that you were talking about yesterday showing. Let's see if it comes up. There it is. <laughs> showing where the different gangsters were uh, in Oklahoma. And actually, historians believe the Wild West actually ended in Oklahoma during that particular era uh, as well. Uh, so we were actual, a, actually able to do that and, and trace those back uh, to the 1930s when actually they were treated as heroes at times uh, as well. Um, let's see if I can go back to that for a second. Okay. Then we did one on the, uh, the anniversary of the moonwalk and, and gave it a different type of presentation as well. So we're making, we're, we're showing history in a different way. We're showing in a platform sense, showing how multimedia, uh, trying to make it appeal to the, the younger generation as well. One of my favorites uh, was a story of a 100-year-old uh, African-American male 
who was able to vote for the first time for uh, uh, an African-American president and how important uh, that was to him as well. Uh, so we're trying to make that. And when you're dealing with online today, what you're dealing with is the battle of page views versus relevance. Okay? If you understand that, we like page views in the newspaper business. Okay? We want those millions and millions of page views. Okay? History, I can tell you, it does not generate a lot of page views. Okay? I'm sorry. Uh, as compared to maybe a crime story or something like that. What history does generate is relevance and time spent on site. Okay? These particular stories, these stories of the ages that we've done, people spend a lot of time with them. Uh, and and they, spent, they spent not only in reading the stories, but looking at the video, looking at the graphics, looking at everything we're doing. So it increases that relevance of your site, which does what? Increases your Google views. Okay? So what we're trying to do and convince those, that commercial aspect of it, is not only can you get sponsorships for this, we're building an inventory that we can get sponsorships for, but we're also building the argument, hey, there's relevance there. Okay? There's time spent on site. It's very important you have this historical context for that relevance issue. Great. Others? David, do you want to contribute? Or? I, I, don't think, um, I don't think what I have pertains specifically to newspapers, but rather an opportunity, perhaps, for the genealogical community to, to participate. Um, let me give you an example of, of what they are doing to produce digital content. The Federation of Genealogical Societies is currently fundraising uh, $3.2 million to digitize the pension and bounty land files of the uh, War of 1812. Uh, while it is the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, it's the bicentennial of the War of 1812 coming up. And, um, and those uh, participants of the, of the War of 1812 uh, Records about them are uh, very important, but they are uh, contained at the National Archives and are undigitized at this point. So given the opportunity, I would say that our community would respond uh, in, a, in a very significant way if there was a way to create the opportunity for, to, for them to contribute to uh, digitizing or preserving uh, newspaper content. And, and I offer as evidence of that their ways that they contribute to other digitization efforts currently. Others? Go ahead, Ram. Yeah, I, <clears throat> the solution here, I think, is going to come from many different sources. I, I've already mentioned how I think the partnerships between libraries, commercial vendors will be part of it. Um, Bernie Riley mentioned um, the fact that the Center for Research Libraries and Redux have done um, millions of pages, really, uh, with the direct funding uh, of research libraries in addition to the public libraries I mentioned earlier. I think that for existing papers, the ones that haven't been orphaned uh, so far, but are, are, I think they will find out new business models. I think the recent um, decision of the New York Times uh, to on a new way, a business model for itself, hopefully will be part of that solution. Um, Newspapers have always looked at different business models. I mentioned earlier that um, the very earliest papers had some very, very different ideas about how to sell themselves and who they were selling themselves to. Um, I'm reminded of one paper in particular, the, the Boston Idiot. Jeff may correct me here. This may even be apocryphal, but it's in some history books. The Boston Idiot was published in the early 1800s, and its business model was as uh, curious as its name if you lived in Boston and were a businessman at the time, if you didn't pay the Boston idiot, then some very, very nefarious dealings were discovered <laughs> about your company and were published in The Idiot on a weekly basis. And if you did contribute to the publisher of The Idiot, then some very nice stories would be published about you. So hopefully, hopefully that will not be part of the new business models emerging, but I think it did exist. And it was actually successful for some years, as I recall. So... Um, it's the papers in the middle. The, I, I worry especially about the papers that are saddled with several hundred thousand pages of 20th century post-copyright, uh, legally uh, intricate material to deal with, and yet that three to 400,000 pages from a small town 
those are the real true orphans. And um, I think that because of the scale, the legal issues, and so on, uh, I think that as we're looking at solutions tomorrow, we might pay a special attention to that category because it's one of the ones that could, you know, fall through the cracks. Okay. LaDonna, did you have anything you want to contribute other than blackmail? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think there we go. I, I think what I can add is really from um, the standpoint of us being consumers, I'm representing here, um, we want to be able to access this. We want to be able to assist. It's just let us have the opportunities. Let us be able to join and show, hey, we have some materials that need to be put out for, you know, accessing um, for scholarship and, you know, to keep up with history. I know a lot of schools are cutting history. That's kind of scary, but they are. And I know simple things I've asked my young teenagers. One of them did not know who Helen Keller was. I found this out two weeks ago. That is sad. Okay, so there's some things that we're missing and I think we're so caught up in, in digital, we're losing it. And so if there's a way to slow it down a little, let us all join in on a consumer-based level along with, you know, more of a, a business models, that sort of thing, then maybe it might not be so such a large venture, but also keep it accessible. <laughs> I know that's kind of hard because it does take funding, and this is the difficult time period we're going through, but in the meantime, we have to handle it some way. But I'm just asking for opportunities. Um, a lot of ethnic groups, for instance, are finally getting on the bandwagon with genealogy and history, and now we're needing those records that haven't been pulled out of those shelves. So how do we handle, you know, that issue? Uh, and sensitively, we, we, he's got a great program here going with some that I did not notice. And, um, but that right there opens up a whole new window to some people who never had an opportunity to even be enlightened by history. So I think as we're moving on to another way, you know, funding-wise with business models and such, is just don't lose sight of the whole purpose, which is on a consumer general public level. Right? Yeah. Thank you. So that leads into really our final question, and we just have a few more minutes before lunch, but really um, it's the devil's advocate question, and if this content goes away, whose stories are lost? Obviously, this is, an inter this is an insurmountable problem, or it seems so, at least, when we talk about it in this way. And it seems as though um, it seems impossible to figure out a way to, to grasp onto all of this content. So as we look at solutions and we look at whose content, uh, who, how, whose stories do we save, um, and for whom are we saving them, that's really, I think, the the ultimate point of, of this panel. And so um, that's where we're going to go in our final question. And then hopefully we'll have a few minutes, just a few minutes for, for questions from all of you. So who wants to tackle this ethical and access issues? Kind of? Yeah, David. I'll start. Um, just I, I think I can make a case for a, a business model. Um, my wife certainly could make the case, and that is that uh, many newspapers have a pay-per-view um, opportunity for researching uh, obituaries and other things for the newspaper. And my credit card purchases would certainly um, indicate that there's quite a business model there for the newspapers that, are, that have employed that. Um, during the Clinton administration, the National Endowment for the Humanities, in conjunction with the White House, uh, uh, Hillary Clinton in particular, uh, started a campaign for My History is America's History, uh, in which they captured uh, the histories of individuals and promoted uh, individual histories being preserved. And with today's technology, many of those histories, we can add art, what we term as artifacts or historical evidence uh, to those histories, and, and we can begin to weave uh, the context of American history through the lives of the people who have lived here. As more and more of those artifacts and the information is attached to particular uh, people, um, there are applications growing for uh, much of that. At Family Search, we've been involved in producing what is basically a pedigree system in which everything would evolve off of that. And so already there are half a dozen or more applications where you take as the basis for that application, you take the uh, pedigree, and then you suspend any type of application that you want off of that. 
So think, for example, uh, of walking into a cemetery, identifying a, a related um, a relative who is interred there in that cemetery. Think now of turning to your application and being able for the, for the application now to tell you how you're related to every other person in the cemetery because you have, uh, as the underlying basis, that pedigree system. If you take that to its natural extent and begin now to assemble the artifacts and the historical newspaper collection to that, uh, you would also be able to see uh, the history of that community emerge through uh, the context of the newspaper content for that community. So I think there are a number of different ways that we can begin to look at uh, the importance of it and, and, uh, and why we would care because we, in so many communities, uh, the newspaper is the history of that community and we would lose uh, that history of Americana. Sure. The OCR software that I have seen is not capable of <coughs> capturing those proper names by human and to intervene in it. And then compounding that is the fact that most metropolitan, major metropolitan newspapers in this country ran the exact same story that you have there in that newspaper in front of you, Deborah. Right? I have no idea what it is, but it's wired. You know, most right. of our content throughout the 20th century is wired. It makes no sense for somebody to go and digitize hundreds of thousands of stories with the same exact story from paper to paper to paper. So how do we still it down? <coughs> Well, you brought up several very good things there. I, I, I think huh, the duplication of AP material is interesting with its own historical parallel. Um, early newspapers in American history uh, were, the main thing they needed was news. You know, they, were, they didn't have the telegraph, telephone, anything else. I mean, horses walking by was 90% of what they saw. So they would steal each other's stories. And if you track, one of the fascinating things to do is track a story that would start in Philadelphia and make its way literally at the pace of a moving horse. It would go west, you know, it would go north. Um, so, but, but those stories are duplicated in, in, in all of those newspapers. This, digresses rather than solves your point. But um, the AP issue is an interesting issue. It's also a legal issue that it gets complicated. Um, that doesn't solve it, but it recognizes it. I think the OCR solution, I, I, I tend to disagree with you about OCR. Um, there are many, there isn't an OCR solution. Many OCR systems use nine uh, OCR engines running simultaneously. They vote and so on. Um, as was mentioned last night at the dinner, there were OCR technologies doing uh, Serbo-Croatian material, uh, Ukrainian, there are all sorts of material um, that uh, seemed impossible a few years ago, um, Cyrillic language OCR. I think that for, uh, for the personal names, the, the issue you're running into, I think that technology will solve that. I think it's very close. And for a lot of the earlier papers, uh, what the commercial vendors are able to do with the support of the libraries and the partners and so on is key. We key all of the headlines. We key a lot of proper names. We key death notice names, that sort of thing, because in the past the OCR technology has not been as good as, as it is now. I think that will go away. Uh, so I think the technology will solve that. The AP issue I think will probably come up again during uh, our discussion this afternoon of legal issues. That, that verges to that. And I know, David, you've dealt a lot with OCR issues, and do you yeah. want to consider that? So we're actually using a combination of that and, and looking at the technologies that would allow both. And so uh, OCR will get you there 95% uh, in many instances, but then the ability to key kind of on the fly, and we, and we term that indexing on the fly, where a user uh, can contribute. And so while you build this catch basin or this reservoir of content, now to have the users of that content come in and help you as, or assist you to index that, that uh, material on the fly. We currently have an indexing force of over 300,000 volunteers indexing content on a daily basis. So we index uh, right now a little over a million names a day uh, in that type of content. Um, Frederick uh, has had a uh, – raise your hand, Frederick. 
He's, he, he's, had, he's had a lot of experience with uh, OCR, and I think it's, um, for a long time, we dismissed it. We dismissed the technology because it couldn't deal with handwriting. Uh, but it's done very well with the print matter, and we're making uh, more strides in, in all of these um, combinations of, uh, I think the capacity is, has increased significantly. Frederick can give you details about uh, some of the work he's done to, to do that. But um, you're, you're right. When all said and done, it comes down to the names and how can we access, because that's what people are interested in. And um, we have a we have a real problem with our with our system and people going into it uh, f to look for family history because when it says name the first name they type in is their own. Uh, well, you have to be deceased to be in our system, and so um, <laughs> mercifully they don't generally find themselves in that first query. Uh, but that is what people want many times in content when they when they Google on that uh, or any other type of content they type in the names and so when when the day is done. It is about the names and about the relationships, and then the story expands into the historical context. You know, if I could just say one thing in, in relation to that. David's mentioning manuscripts that can't be OCR, and I think that the solution to that is for the end users, for the contributors, to be able to annotate and transcribe material themselves. And I think the next generation of this material is already upon a number of us where we're giving... Um, not like Google, where it's just anonymous, but you know, people who identify themselves. Um, the ability, if they will identify themselves, to annotate, transcribe material, and uh, not only uh, transcribe manuscript material, which can't be OCR'd, but to correct personal name spellings in these databases. One of the problems with the name expression is not just OCR, And just a reminder, if you can identify yourself, that would be great. And speak up loudly since we don't have the mics. Yes. Uh, the lights off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I have a question on your side. You know, tell us a little bit more. How are you going to uh, evaluate the reliability of this particular site? The questions you're going to use. And, and also, I, I, I just got to ask this. So why do we fly? I didn't know. <laughs> well, actually, I think um, what gets the most hits are probably we. You're talking about as far as overall of all those stories, probably Geronimo, uh, because of there was we try to connect it to some news value of today and the um, controversy over uh, uh, his last resting place. Let's say. Uh, and that, so we try to connect that so there's that care value connected to the news value uh, as well. Um, uh, how we determine it's, whether it's successful or not, um, I think I'm looking at it over the long run that we're able to have some very rich stories that are preserved over a long period of time online. Whether other people have those types of values or not is always to be debated. Uh, but I, I just think we have to preserve history in different ways, and we're trying to seek different ways through this. Value in certain sense is whether we can obtain sponsors. Now, we have a sponsor for our archives uh, that's sent out to the school system, so they are able to access it for free. Um, and we're still seeking sponsors for uh, this particular project. We've had some uh, interest in it, uh, but we're still seeking that. So there's value on that side. Uh, but again, the value to me is, you know, it does generate thousands of page views over a long period of time. It's not a short type of, you know, uh, type of gain. It's a long-term gain you have to think about is that it's there and it's consistently gaining page views and time spent on site. Geronimo being, being a prime example is page views were actually peaked two or three months after the story when there was another story came up about it, we put it back on the side as you should be interested in this uh, as well. And so that's, that generated more page views in that particular uh, stories of the ages. And we do that. We will 
showcase it on our cover page as something you would be uh, of interest that relates to today's news. Okay. Um, I'm going to take one more question. Is that okay? Really quick. A really quick question. No quick questions. Every, oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> is, is, the, is the historical value of presenting worth the return on investment? Is that your question? Um, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know whether we evaluated we've evaluated as concerned to relevance issues, and it is worth the investment uh, as well. Uh, it is valued within our newsroom as well. We have reporters wanting to do this, and, and so we have to pitch it and give them time to do these types of stories. But it's a collaborative effort. We've drawn in different parts of the newsroom in order to do that, and people who value history uh, to project this. So we see it as a value to the overall depth of our website not just another crime story that's on your website, but something that's deep and something that you're doing that goes f well beyond the news of the day. And we also do in-depth stories that are not stories of the ages as well. But we just see that it, it, it adds to the overall value of our site. So that's where we see the return on investment.